Uh, welcome to lecture number 21 in our course on fundamentals of transport processes. Uh, we had got down to the business of an actually analyzing flows of importance in practical applications. Um, we looked at transport in cylindrical coordinates and I told you that uh, in cylindrical coordinates as an example of curvilinear coordinates where the uh, coordinates uh, constant r is not a straight line and due to that the form of the differential equation that we get for unsteady transport is slightly different. Uh, from that what we had for the transport from a plane surface. And we had looked at uh, a couple of problems, one was heat conduction from a wire using a similarity transform. A uh, second problem that we looked at was the unsteady state conduction into a cylinder, into a cylindrical volume. And then we had started looking at the flow in a pipe and uh, doubtless, uh, uh, needless to say this is a commercially important flow. And the way we solved this problem was to first consider a cylindrical shell and apply the momentum balance condition. Rate of change of momentum is equal to sum of applied forces on the surface. Uh, the rate of change of momentum is of course the change in momentum per unit time, which is the density times the change in velocity divided by the time interval. Uh, and of course, the density times the velocity is a momentum density per unit volume. So, you have to multiply that by the volume of the shell over which you are doing the balance. Okay. And once we do that, we get an equation for the momentum balance as a function of the forces acting on the surfaces of this shell. There are two cylindrical surfaces at r and r plus delta r that are bounding this shell and there are two plane surfaces at z and z plus delta z. We are writing a balance equation for the momentum in the z direction along the axis of the pipe. Therefore, for the cylindrical surfaces, the force exerted is due to the shear stress, the viscous shear stress that acts tangential to the surface along the z direction. For the two flat surfaces at z and z plus delta z, the forces are due to the pressure which is normal to the surface. As you know, pressure always acts perpendicular to the surface and is directed inward. In this pipe flow, there is a variation in pressure along the length of the pipe. The flow happens because you have a high pressure at the inlet and a low pressure at the outlet. This pressure difference causes the flow and there is a pressure gradient at every point within the fluid. The pressure is gradually decreasing linearly with length as you go along the pipe and due to that there is a pressure gradient. Therefore, if I take a small section of this pipe, the cylindrical shell that I have been analyzing all this while, there is a difference in pressure between the surface at the left, the upstream surface and the downstream surface. And that pressure difference also enters into the momentum balance equation. And once we put all of that in, we got an equation for the unsteady, fully developed momentum balance condition. Fully developed means that the velocity is invariant along the axis of the pipe. It does vary from the center to the wall, but as you travel along the axis, at any radial location, the velocity is independent of axial location. And within this momentum balance equation, we had put in an expression for the shear stress as the viscosity times the velocity gradient. Okay. And from that, we got the momentum balance equation. Okay. At steady state, of course, you can solve it quite easily. It is an ordinary differential equation in R because the pressure itself is independent of R. I had discussed with you in the last class why pressure is independent of R. It is basically because if I write a momentum balance equation for the radial direction as well, it would contain various terms. The inertia in the radial direction which is proportional to the radial velocity, the viscous stresses which are once again proportional to the derivatives of the radial velocity and there is also 
a pressure gradient in the radial direction. The radial velocity is identically equal to 0 and therefore, the pressure gradient the variation pressure in the radial direction has to be equal to 0. Therefore, since the pressure is independent of the radial coordinate it is a function only of the axial coordinate. So, because the radial velocity is identically equal to 0 all terms in the radial momentum equation which depend upon the radial velocity are equal to 0. Therefore, the pressure variation in the radial direction also has to be equal to 0. Therefore, p is only a function of the axial coordinate and we had solved this to obtain the Hagen Poiseuille law for the flow in a pipe. Okay. As a function of the pressure gradient okay. and uh, of course, this gives you the variation in velocity along the radial direction. The total volumetric flow rate through the pipe okay, if it is a volumetric flow rate I should not be having a density there. Okay. So, the total volumetric flow rate through the pipe is equal to the velocity times the cross sectional area. Okay. But however, since the velocity is changing as a function of radius okay, I need to take a small section of the cross section find out the velocity on that multiply by the, that by the area 2 pi r times delta r and then integrate it over the entire cross section okay. and that gives me uh, a flow rate which goes as pi r power 4 by 8 mu times dp by dx. The mean velocity is the flow rate divided by the cross sectional area which turns out to be half the maximum velocity at the center of the pipe. From that we got the shear stress, the shear stress at any point in the fluid and the shear stress at the wall by setting r is equal to capital R. Okay. And from this we got the shear stress as a function of the maximum velocity. We know how the maximum velocity is related to the pressure gradient. So, you get the shear stress as a function of the pressure gradient. Okay. And from that we got the familiar friction factor versus Reynolds number relationship f is equal to 16 by R e. Okay. Um, uh, for the laminar flow in a pipe and as I told you in the last class the laminar flow is valid when the Reynolds number is less than about 2100. When the Reynolds number goes beyond 2100 there is a spontaneous transition from the laminar flow to a more complicated flow profile called a turbulent flow. Even when the Reynolds number is more than 2100 the laminar velocity profile is still a solution of the equations. However, that solution becomes unstable and any small disturbance will make the solution spontaneously go to some other solution. So, there is a transition from one solution that has become unstable to another solution that is transient but stable. And this turbulent velocity profile as I told you consists of large fluctuations in the velocity both in the stream wise and the cross stream direction. There are eddies correlated parcels of moving fluid of various length scales within the flow all the way from the large scale to a small scale called the Kolmogorov scale. And because there are these eddies these also transfer momentum across the flow. In addition to the molecular uh, diffusion mechanism which transfers momentum across the flow. There is also the eddy diffusion mechanism due to parcels of fluid moving in a correlated fashion and that results in a much higher rate of transfer than what you would expect for a laminar flow because the correlated motion of the eddies transfers momentum across the flow far more efficiently than the molecular diffusion mechanism in a laminar flow and that results in a much higher friction factor or, or, or a drag force. Okay. The wall shear stress in a turbulent flow is much higher than what you would expect for a laminar flow because of this efficient momentum transport mechanism. And also because of the efficient momentum transport mechanism the velocity profile is far flatter than the parabolic profile in a laminar flow it looks very much like a plug flow at the center with a sharp transition to zero velocity near the walls. Okay. 
So then we started looking at the problem of an unsteady flow in a pipe, an oscillatory flow. Okay. So as I said, for example, the, the pumping of blood by the heart is oscillatory in nature. It is not an exact sine wave, but it is still periodic in time. Okay. So in order to model these kinds of flows, one could for example take an oscillatory flow okay, where the pressure gradient or the pressure difference across the two ends is an oscillatory function of time. In this particular case, we took that oscillatory function to be cos of omega times t, where omega is the frequency of oscillations. However, this procedure can be used for any type of time periodic flows because any periodic function can be expressed as the sum of uh, a sine wave of or a cosine wave of that frequency plus its higher harmonics. So I could separate out the waveform into a fundamental mode and the harmonics, solve for the velocity field individually for each of these and then add them up all together to get the, the response for the entire periodic function that I have. Okay. So in that sense, this procedure can be used even for more complicated um, modulations of the, 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 the pressure gradient across the tube. Okay. So we had a differential equation for the velocity field which contained an inhomogeneous term. Okay, so this equation for the velocity field contained an inhomogeneous term that was k cos omega t. The boundary conditions for the uh, flow through the pipe, no slip condition at the wall, the velocity has to be equal to 0 at the wall at r is equal to capital R. At r is equal to 0, we have the symmetry condition that we had discussed earlier because uh, the, 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 the velocity gradient cannot be discontinuous at the center, the, the derivative of velocity with respect to radius has to be equal to 0. Only then will the value of the derivative be the same when you approach it from different directions. Okay. And we had used a scaling t star is equal to omega t and r star is equal to r by capital R. Okay. And then we had scaled the equation. Okay. As I said, there are two ways to scale it. One is with the inertial scale, rho omega by k, okay, and the other is with the viscous scale, mu by k r square. Okay, you could choose either of these. Um, either of these would give you a mathematically accurate result. Okay, however, if you want to use physical insight to solve the problem, you should scale it by the viscous scale when the Reynolds number is small, so that viscous effects are dominant because you would expect the viscous term to be large compared to the inertial term in that case. Okay. Whereas you should scale it by the inertial scales at higher Reynolds number. Okay. We started off scaling by the viscous scales and proceeded to see what happens. Okay. And out comes a Reynolds number R e omega okay, is equal to rho omega r square by mu. Okay which is the ratio of the inertial term, the unsteady term and the viscous term, okay, the, the term due to viscous diffusion of momentum. Okay. And we got an equation for the velocity field in terms of r e omega and there was an inhomogeneous term cos of t. Okay. And the boundary conditions turn out to be homogeneous once again. Okay. And we solved this equation okay, subject to boundary conditions, okay, there is a mistake here. subject to boundary conditions, uh, the solution comes about quite easily if I assume that I work with a complex velocity which is u z times e power i t. Basically the system is being forced by an oscillatory pressure gradient which is proportional to e power i t. That means that you would expect the response also to have modulation with that same frequency. Okay. It may not have the same phase but it has to have the same frequency because my equation is linear. Okay. So we put in a trial function of the form uz plus is equal to uz tilde 
e power i t okay. and from that we got From that we finally managed to get a solution okay, by using uh, a separation into a particular solution and a homogeneous solution. Okay. The homogeneous solution was in the form of Bessel functions J naught and Y naught. Okay. Straight away we could set the coefficient of the term proportional to Y naught equal to 0 because we know that the Bessel function Y naught goes to minus infinity at R star is equal to 0. Okay. We had discussed the forms of both J naught and Y naught as a function of X okay. Okay. and J naught of X has an oscillatory form. It starts at 1 and it has an oscillatory form. Okay. This is J naught of X whereas Y naught of X starts at minus infinity. Since y0 of x starts at minus infinity, if the constant c2 were non-zero, then the velocity, the general solution would go to infinity at, uh, at 0. Okay. So, since we cannot have that, okay, therefore the constant c2 has to be equal to 0. Okay. And uh, This has to be plus 1. Okay. So, we got the particular solution as just a constant that is the simplest particular solution that will satisfy this equation. Okay. So, we got the particular solution as just a constant, the general solution as a Bessel function and from that we constructed the total solution. Okay. And u z star is of course, the real part of the complex velocity and from that I can get the velocity variation as a function of time. Okay. So, this is the mathematical solution does not quite give us very much physical insight unless we actually plot it out and see how it looks. Okay. In order to get more physical insight one can look at the limits of low and high Reynolds number okay. and in the limit of low Reynolds number you can do one of two things. Okay. The first thing you could do is actually just take this solution just take this solution and expand it in a series in the Reynolds number. Okay. So, that is one way to do it. The other way to do it is to take the starting governing equation and then expand it in a series in r e omega. Okay. Okay. So, in the limit of r e small compared to 1, if I completely neglect the inertial terms, what I get is this equation that looks something like this. Okay. This is 1 by r d by dr of r d u z by dr minus cos t is equal to 0. Now, this first term Okay, does not have any time derivatives in it. Okay. So, because of that I can straight away integrate this in time to get the velocity as minus 1 by fourth into 1 minus r square into cos t. Okay. And from that we got the velocity out the scaled velocity the dimensional velocity in terms of the pressure gradient. Okay. And this dimensional velocity is, ident is identical to what you would have for the steady flow if the pressure gradient were just given by k cos omega t. Okay. This is the same Hagen Posey law for the flow in a pipe except that instead of having a steady pressure, the pressure in this case is given by k cos omega t. Okay. And I explained the reason to, uh, uh, for this in the previous lecture. Okay. The Reynolds number rho omega r square by mu, I can write this as omega divided by nu by r square. 
Okay. So, this is equivalent to the time, okay, uh, the time it takes for diffusion, okay, because divided by the time period of the oscillation, okay, because omega is goes as 2 pi by the time period of oscillation. omega is 2 pi by the time period of oscillation. The time it takes for diffusion across a length proportional to r is equal to r square by nu, where r is the pipe radius and nu is the kinematic viscosity. Kinematic viscosity has dimensions of length square per time. Therefore, the time taken goes as r square by nu. Okay. So, therefore, the time for diffusion is r square by nu and I can write the Reynolds number as the ratio of these two time scales. Reynolds number is small implies that the time taken for diffusion is small compared to the period of oscillation. So, that by the time the, the, the pressure changes its value over a time comparable to the period of oscillation, the diffusion takes place very fast compared to that and therefore, the velocity field looks like the instantaneous velocity field you would have had okay, if the pressure gradient were given by that instantaneous value of the pressure gradient because the, the response of the fluid is much faster than the, the rate at which the uh, pressure is oscillating. The time for diffusion is much smaller than the period of oscillation. So, in that case you get something that is close to the steady value. So, this is just the steady solution. What happens if the Reynolds number is not 0, but still a small number. Okay. What happens if the Reynolds number is not exactly 0, but still very small. Okay. Okay, so, we will come back to this a little later. What happens in the limit r e omega small compared to 1? Okay. I can consider the Reynolds number as a small parameter okay. and in that case I can expand my velocity. Okay. I can expand u z tilde is equal to plus etcetera. Okay. So, I am using an expansion for the velocity field in this small parameter. Okay. The original equation that I had was the i u z tilde is equal to minus 1. Okay, so, that was the original equation that I had. Okay. So, within this equation I substitute this expansion in the limit r e small compared to 1. This expansion for u z I substitute into this equation. Okay. So, what do I get? this minus 1. Okay. So, this is the expansion okay, 
of uz in a series in r e omega. Now, I can collect terms that are multiplied by r e omega, r e omega square as well as terms that are independent of r e omega okay? because I am expanding in a series in the small parameter r e omega in the limit as r e omega goes to 0. Okay? So, if r e omega were identically equal to 0, then I could neglect all the terms proportional to r e omega and I would get on, on the left hand side I will just get 0 okay, because on the left hand side I have an r e omega that is multiplying everything. So, on the left hand side I will just get 0, okay. on the right hand side I will get is equal to minus 1. Okay. So, these are the terms that are independent of r e omega in the limit as r e omega goes to 0. Okay. However, I do have terms that are proportional to r e omega in the limit as r e omega goes to 0. Okay. In particular, on the left hand side, I have r e omega i times u z naught. Okay. On the right hand side, I have plus r e omega 1 by r d by d r of r d u z 1 by d r. Okay, so, that is on the right hand side and then I can collect the terms that are proportional to r e omega square okay, u z 1 is equal to and on the right hand side I have plus r e omega square 1 by r d by d r okay. Okay. So, this is the expansion of the left and the right hand side in a series in r e omega. Okay. So, this is the expansion in a series in r e omega. Okay. Now, I am taking the limit as r e omega goes to 0. Okay. So, when I take the limit r e omega goes to 0, if r e omega were identically equal to 0, right, then there will be only the first term, the underlying term that is entering into the balance. Okay. But of course, r e omega is small, but not 0. Okay. In that case, if r e omega is small, very much less than 1, implies that r e omega square is small compared to r e omega okay, etcetera, r e omega cubed is small compared to r e omega square and so on. If this balance is to hold for all values of r e omega in the limit as r e omega goes to 0, that means these individual coefficients have all got to be equal to 0. Okay. If this balance is to hold for all values of r e omega in the limit as r e omega goes to 0, then the individual coefficients of the equation of 1, r e omega, r e omega square, etcetera, they have all got to be equal to 0. Okay. So, this equation is termed as the order 1 equation. Okay. This is termed as the order r e omega equation. Okay. This is order r e omega square okay, and so on. Okay. You can keep expanding to higher and higher orders in this manner and get the higher and higher corrections to this equation. So, the important point is that if the entire equation, the entire expansion is to be valid in the limit r e omega goes to 0, that means that the order 1 equation has to be 0, the order r e omega equation has to be 0, the order r e omega square equation has to be 0 and so on. Okay. This order 1 means that the terms in this equation remain finite as r e omega goes to 0. Okay. Order 1 means that the terms in this equation remain finite as I take the limit r e omega going to 0. The order r e omega means that the terms of the equation decrease to 0 proportional to r e omega in the limit r e omega going to 0. That is the meaning of order r e omega. 
this capital O stands for order. Okay. Similarly, the order R e omega square term, okay. this implies that the terms in the equation decrease proportional to R e omega square in the limit as R e omega goes to 0. Okay. So now, each of these equations individually has to be equal to 0. Okay. What that implies is that 0 is equal to 1 by R d by dr of R du z by dr minus 1. Okay. So that is the order 1 equation. The first correction is I u z 1, I am sorry, I u z not is equal to 1 by r d by dr of r d u z 1 by dr, okay, this is not here, okay. And then the second equation is I u z 2 is 1 by r d by dr of r d u z 1 by dr. Okay. and so on. You will get a whole series of equations and you can cut off that series at any, uh, uh, at, at any desired value to get a solution of sufficient accuracy. Now, the way to solve this equation is clear. I can solve the first equation for u z naught, put that u z naught into the inhomogeneous term here and solve for u z 1 put that u z 1 into the inhomogeneous term over here. Okay, so, this u z 1 will go into the inhomogeneous, this solution will go in here, this solution will go in here. Put u z 1 into the inhomogeneous solution there and get u z 2 okay, and so on. Okay. Let me just take here. Okay. So, this is u z 1, u z 2 okay, and so on. Okay. Boundary conditions the boundary conditions that we had used were u z is equal to 0 at r star is equal to 1 and d u z by d r is equal to 0 at r star is equal to 0. Okay. These boundary conditions also have to be expanded in a series. Okay. These boundary conditions also have to be expanded in a series. So, I have to have u z naught plus r e omega u z 1 plus r e omega square u z 2 is equal to 0 at r star is equal to 1 and d by d r of u z naught plus is equal to 0 at r star is equal to 0. Okay, so, those are the boundary conditions. In, insert the expansion for the velocity into the boundary conditions and uh, once again set the coefficients of order 1, order r e omega and order r e omega square individually to 0. Okay. So, insert the expansion into the boundary conditions and set the coefficients of 1 r e omega r e omega square individually to 0 in the expansion. Okay. Therefore, you will get u z naught is equal to 0, u z 1 is equal to 0 and u z 2 is equal to 0 at r star is equal to 1. Okay. So, there is at the wall of the pipe each individual uh, component of the velocity, the order 1 velocity, the order r e velocity, order r e square velocity, they are all individually equal to 0. Okay. And at the center, you have d u z naught by d r is equal to 0, d u z 1 by d r is equal to 0, d u z 2 by d r is equal to 0 at r star is equal to 1. Okay. So, these are the boundary conditions that can be used for solving each of these individual equations. Okay.
note that the equation for u z naught is identical to the equation that I had at for r u omega is equal to 0. Okay. If you recall that when I did my approximation for low Reynolds number, I had an equation of this kind okay, 1 by r d by dr of r d u z by dr minus cos t is equal to 0. When expressed in terms of the u tilde okay, that is u z is equal to real part of u tilde times e power i t. Okay. So, when expressed in terms of u tilde the equation is actually identical to the leading order equation. Okay. So, this equation this order 1 equation is identical to the equation that I had exactly in the limit of 0 Reynolds number. Okay. This is the 0 Reynolds number equation okay. and therefore, I can straight away write down the solution. Okay. The solution is u z tilde naught is equal to minus 1 by 4 1 minus r star square. Okay. So, that is the leading order solution for u z naught okay. and that gives me the steady velocity profile. Okay. For u z 1 okay, this is the equation okay. this is the equation it contains no inhomogeneous term. However, it does contain u z naught on the left hand side okay. it does contain the term u z naught on the left hand side. Okay. So, therefore, I can solve this subject to the condition that u z is equal to u z naught on the left hand side. Okay. In order to get the solution for u z 1 okay, and you will find that u z 1 okay, is equal to i into 3 minus 4 r square plus r power 4 by 64. Okay. You can easily verify that this solution actually satisfies both boundary conditions. Okay at r is equal to 1 this is equal to 0 at r is equal to 0 its derivative is equal to 0. Okay. So, this solution obtained from the inhomogeneous equation for u z 1 okay, it satisfies both boundary conditions. This can be inserted into the equation that I have for u z 2 okay. this can be inserted into the equation that I have for u z 2 and this can once again be solved to get a solution for u z 2. Okay. And if you actually solve that equation you will find that u z 2 is equal to minus 19-27 r square plus 9 r power 4 plus r power 6. Okay, divided by oh, this should be minus two three zero four. Okay. Uh, so this is the solution for u z two. U z two can be put as an inhomogeneous term in the equation for u z three, and once again you'll get a solution. Okay. So you can get a solution to whatever order in r e omega that you want. Okay. And one can put all of these together to get the final velocity profile. Okay. So, my final equation for the velocity based upon this expansion will be u z star which is a scaled velocity is equal to minus 1 minus r square cos t by 4 minus r e omega sin of t okay. into three minus four r square plus r power four okay. divided by sixty four okay. plus r e omega square into 19 minus 27 r square plus 9 r power 4 minus r power 6 okay, into cos of t by 2304 plus order of 
r e omega cubed. Okay. So, this is an approximate solution. Okay. We have evaluated it as a series. There are still terms in the series we have not evaluated, but those terms are order r e omega cubed or smaller. Okay. So, for example, if the Reynolds number is 0 0.01, terms we have not evaluated are 10 power minus 6 approximately. Okay. If, it, if the r e omega is about uh, 0 0.1, terms you have not evaluated are in the order of 1 in a 1000. Okay. This was the leading order steady solution that we got, the, 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 the pipe flow, parabolic flow in a pipe okay, for the case where the Reynolds number is identically equal to 0. Okay. That has a phase that is exactly the same phase as the pressure itself pressure we had imposed was cos t, velocity goes as minus cos t because when the pressure gradient is positive, the velocity goes in the negative direction. Okay. However, there are corrections due to this due to inertia. Okay. The first correction to this due to inertia is this one, it is proportional to the Reynolds number in the limit of small Reynolds number. Okay. And this thing has a phase shift of pi by 2, it goes as sin t. Okay. So, the, the inertia causes a phase shift between the pressure gradient and the velocity. And then there is a second correction which once again goes as cos t and is proportional to r e omega square. Okay. And using this I can evaluate all the higher order terms in this series. So, this procedure of expansion is what is called as a regular perturbation expansion. In order to get an approximate solution, whenever you have a small parameter in this problem. In this particular case, we had a small parameter that was r e omega. Okay. And so, we expanded out the velocity u z as a series in r e omega. Okay. And we inserted that expansion into the governing equation as well as the boundary conditions in order to get the both the governing equation and the boundary conditions as a series in r e omega. In the limit as r e omega goes to 0, the term proportional to r e omega will be small compared to the term proportional to order 1 because the order 1 term remains finite even as r e omega goes to 0. So, the order term that is proportional to r e omega will be small compared to the leading order term which is order 1 the term that is r e omega square will be small compared to the term proportional to r e omega. Therefore, each of those individual coefficients can individually be set equal to 0. I set the order 1 equation equal to 0, the order r e omega equation equal to 0, the order r e omega square equation equal to 0 and so on. Okay. And you do the same thing with the boundary conditions. And once you do that, you can solve each of these equations individually. Okay. In this particular case, the order 1 equation gave the parabolic velocity profile for the flow in a tube, which is exactly opposite to the pressure gradient. Okay, it has the same phase, but it is opposite in sign to the pressure gradient. However, there are corrections to this due to inertia. And we can calculate systematically what is the correction at order r e omega, the correction at order r e omega square and so on. Okay, so, we can calculate it, each individual correction. In, uh, because we have a series of equations in which as you can see the leading order equation contains only u z naught and an inhomogeneous term. The first correction contains a, a term uh, a, 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 a derivative of u z 1 and an inhomogeneous term which is proportional to u z naught. That inhomogeneous term has already been evaluated in the order 1 equation. So, I can put insert that inhomogeneous term into the order r e equation, get the solution, insert that solution into the order r e square equation and get the solution of that and continue that series. Continue that series up to the extent required to get a solution of the accuracy that I need. Okay. And I just illustrated to you the way that I would do that. Okay. It is just a matter of simply solving these equations in order to get the solution. As expected, we get the steady solution with the pressure given by cos t as the leading order solution and then there are corrections to that. 
there is an r e omega correction which is the first effect of inertia okay, on the leading order solution and then there is the r e omega square correction and so on. Okay. And in this particular solution we have neglected terms that are proportional to r e omega cubed and higher order terms. Okay. And as I told you this illustrates the procedure of a regular perturbation expansion. We, calc we had got a solution of the complete equations earlier in terms of a Bessel function but as I said that does not give you very good physical insight into the problem. In this particular case we have chosen one particular limit of this uh, equation in the limit where the Reynolds number is small and managed to get a solution in terms of an expansion. This expansion procedure will be useful even when we cannot get analytical solutions to the equation. This particular case we managed to get an analytical solution as a Bessel function. But there are problems where there are multiple equations to be solved. In that case, you might not be able to get an analytical solution to the equation. A perturbation expansion procedure would still work in that case to give you an approximate solution in the particular limiting case that you are interested in. So that is the, the power and the usefulness of these regular perturbation expansions. So, so far we have looked at the limit where r e omega is small compared to 1. What about the limit where r e omega is large compared to 1? Okay. In that case you would expect the inertial terms to be large compared to the viscous terms. And as I said one has to go back and scale the velocity by the inertial terms. Okay. So that the velocity scaled by the inertial terms is an order 1 number. So let us just look at that scaling briefly before we look at the procedure for solving that equation. So my original equation in terms of uz was rho times duz by dt is equal to mu 1 over r d by dr of r duz by dr minus k cos omega t. Okay. Now I define as usual r star is equal to r by r where capital R is the radius of the pipe and t star is equal to omega t. Okay. Once you do that you get rho omega partial u z by partial t star is equal to mu by r square 1 by r t by dr of r t u z by dr minus k cos of t star. As before I divide throughout by k okay, to get a dimensionless equation. Okay, so I will get rho omega by k t u z by d t star is equal to mu by r square k 1 by r minus cos t. And if I am interested in the limit of high Reynolds number, I have to scale velocity by the inertial scales. If I am interested in the limit of high Reynolds number, I have to scale velocity by the inertial scales. Okay. So I should define u z star is equal to u z rho omega by k. Okay, I should be defining u z star in this manner. Okay. And if I define u z star in this manner, My equation will become duz star by dt star is equal to mu by rho omega r square 1 by r d by dr of r duz star by dr minus cos.
and this of course is 1 over the Reynolds number, this is the inverse of the Reynolds number, 1 divided by the Reynolds number. Okay. So therefore, the equation can be written as du z star by dt star is equal to 1 over re omega. minus cos of t. Okay. Good. So, as I said, I am considering the limit of high Reynolds number. I am considering the limit of high Reynolds number. Okay. That means that 1 by R e is small. Therefore, naively, if I were to try to solve this problem simplistically, I would say, why do not we just neglect this entire term here? Okay. Why do not we just neglect this term and solve the rest of the equation because the Reynolds number is large. So, 1 over R e is small. So, we just neglect that term, go ahead and solve the rest of the equation. Okay. So, what happens if you do that? You get d u z by d t is equal to minus cos t. This can be integrated quite easily. Okay, du z by dt is equal to minus cos t implies that u z is equal to minus sin t. So, this is the solution in the limit of high Reynolds number. Okay. Now, we have to satisfy boundary conditions. Okay. Boundary conditions. du z by dr is equal to 0 at r is equal to 0. Clearly, that boundary condition is satisfied. If I take the derivative of u z that I have, since u z is independent of r, its derivative is identically equal to 0. Okay. How about the boundary condition at the wall of the pipe? Okay. How about the boundary condition at the wall of the pipe, which is that u z is equal to 0 at r is equal to 1. Okay. Note that the boundary condition has to be satisfied at all instants in time. Okay. Boundary condition has to be satisfied at every value of time. The velocity is 0 for each and every time value. Can we satisfy that boundary condition with this solution? Clearly not. Okay. Since the solution was independent of r, the velocity at the boundary does not go to 0 at r is equal to 1 and there is no way for us to satisfy this boundary condition okay, by using this solution. So, this solution for the equation cannot satisfy this boundary condition. Okay. So, clearly in the limit of very high Reynolds number, we have a solution that does not satisfy the boundary conditions. If we just simplistically go ahead and neglect the viscous term in the equation, because there is a coefficient 1 over r e omega in front of the viscous term. Okay. Why is that? Okay. Why can we not satisfy the boundary condition? Okay. And what should we do to ensure that the boundary condition is satisfied? Because in the real physical system, in the real pipe, the velocity is actually 0 at the wall at all times, whereas the mathematical solution that we have so far there seems to be no way to satisfy that. Okay. So, we look at the reasons for that, we will continue this in the next lecture. Think about it. Okay. What is it that we did while trying to solve the problem, which made it impossible for us to satisfy that boundary condition. Okay. We will come back and look at this in the next lecture. We will see you then.